Hello and welcome. It's another day on Business Morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwagu. Well, the United Nations World Tourism Organization has announced that the tourism sector's losses reached $320 billion during the first five months of 2020, as the number of international tourists dropped by 56% due to the coronavirus pandemic. The UN body says the amount of revenue lost in January to May is more than three times the loss during the global economic crisis of 2009. Joining me now to talk about this and the importance of restarting tourism soon is the Director of Africa at the United Nations World Tourism Organization, Elsia Grandcourt. Thank you very much for joining us, Elsia. Good morning, Chimzi, and thank you for the opportunity. Right. So tell me, how important is the tourism sector to global economic recovery post-COVID-19? Indeed, as you have just mentioned in the figures you shared, it does show that uh, tourism has a very uh, big importance in uh, our everyday lives. And unfortunately, with this pandemic, we've seen this, this uh, drastic uh, fall in terms of arrival figures internationally, globally, but uh, specifically for the Africa region, we have seen that compared to last year, 2019, we are now today at a minus 47%. For a region that was uh, showing uh, uh, a positive growth, this is a very dramatic fall. And um, as you know, this dramatic fall and with the importance of tourism, this is impacting heavily on livelihoods, on jobs. And that is why it is very important now to look at restarting tourism, but as we see it safe to do so, have the proper measures in place, the different protocols, because as our Secretary General has been discussing with different governments, with other UN agencies, with other private sector stakeholders, is there are two things uh, that must be taken into consideration at this point. It's looking at the public health uh, situation, putting emphasis on this, but whilst at the same time also protecting jobs and businesses. Now, can you quantify how much African countries' uh, tourism sector may have lost to this pandemic? I mean, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 the loss in international tourism right now, uh, in terms of arrivals, we are at a minus 47%. But in terms of the real figures, it, it keeps changing because, of course, we've seen uh, a loss uh, in, in terms of flights have, have stopped. Uh, hotels are not uh, really uh, into business and all the services has been affected. The impact has been very huge uh, all around, not only for the Africa region, but uh, as you know, globally, because this is a, a global pandemic. It's not just related to our region. Now, what is the level of Africa's preparedness to get tourism going? I believe uh, every country has been putting a lot of effort since the beginning of this pandemic, first to mitigate uh, this uh, virus. Uh, and secondly, now that uh, this situation has shifted and we are seeing that the borders are slowly reopening, the focus of the, of the countries is now going towards putting the safety measures in place uh, the health protocols in order to be able to open the borders gradually and welcome the visitors. Now, as countries gradually open up, how best can tourism restart, you know, in the midst of the pandemic? Well, the borders will have to be open gradually based on several factors, as, as you know, uh, related to flights, related to the, the different protocols being in place. But I think primarily, and what our experts have also been uh, uh, sharing, is that a long haul international travel will take a while uh, to, re to be reestablished. So that is why a majority of countries are focusing their attention on first domestic tourism and then moving to intra-regional tourism within the continent. But definitely the protocols, the health protocols have to be put in place from the point of arrival all the way through the, the different services on the ground and also to be able to reinstate and reestablish the 
confidence uh, to the to the tourist. It's very important for countries to keep on uh, working on these measures based on the guidelines that uh, we have issued, as well as WHO and ECAO. Now, what major challenges do you foresee for African countries in trying to restart tourism? I mean, the challenges uh, all around would be uh, it, the fact that it would take a while to, to reinstate the long haul. So the focus has, uh, as many countries have uh, considered, is to put it on uh, domestic tourism. The challenges that will be there is, of course, being able to have the, the right setup in terms of the health and safety protocols in place, rebuilding the confidence because this is key. I mean, if somebody is coming to visit you, they want to, to be assured that there are the protocols in place. And if any eventuality will happen, if there is a surge, if there is uh, any uh, issue that will happen to the person, they will feel confident that the country is prepared and geared up to be able to either work on the repatriation if there is a need to be, or if they need to be taken care of. So I think these are very key. That is why we say the emphasis is to be put on the uh, health and safety protocols. So how does the UNWTO hope to support its member countries to restart tourism? Our Secretary General has been from the beginning of this pandemic uh, working very closely in close collaboration with uh, the different member states, the African member states, also uh, international organizations, other UN agencies, and very importantly, the private sector. They have been discussing, and that is why at the beginning we started off with a set of recommendations. And today we've issued some global uh, guidelines that members are using it to base their own protocols that they are establishing at home. But at the same time, since a lot, a big part of our work is focused on technical support to our members, we've launched what we call a technical support package, which is centered around three pillars. It's the economic recovery, the marketing and promotion aspect of it, and strengthening the institutional uh, relations. This is very key because you need to continue to collaborate. We need to continue to, to, to stand in solidarity with each other and learn from each other. Countries should keep on talking to each other to learn the best practices and also to be able to start the tourism. So with these, um, uh, with these guidelines, we have seen countries that have already established their own uh, health protocols and they're using this as the basis to, to shape uh, the, the different safety measures that they are putting in place, including Nigeria, because several countries, including Nigeria, they have a set up uh, high-level committees, which include government, uh, 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 different government ministries, to be able to work around uh, tackling all the issues associated with this pandemic. Now, talking about uh, Nigeria uh, specifically, what do you make of Nigeria's tourism sector? I think Nigeria has a very vibrant uh, sector in terms of that you have a lot of attributes. You have the, the, the beach, you have the, the wildlife, you have the culture, the gastronomy. Um, but there we see that it's a sector that has not fully maximize the potential that is there. And also in part uh, to um, related to the statistics. Uh, we think that uh, a lot, a big part of that uh, has been underreported. And that is why when we worked uh, with the Ministry of Tourism Master Plan, this is one of the key aspects that came out. And two years ago, when we did our commission meeting in, in Nigeria, we ran parallelly a workshop on uh, statistics, on data collection, and this is the approach we've been taking with the ministry um, uh, in terms of helping also with Nigeria's tourism to ensure that the, the, the figures are captured uh, in order to be able to help to make uh, um, strategic plans going forward. Now, aside from COVID-19, Nigeria is saddled with a fall in oil price, which is um, its main foreign exchange earner. Now, do you think Nigeria's tourism sector has got the potentials to end the country in no foreign exchange? Uh, 
I mentioned, uh, Nigeria is a country that is endowed with several uh, positive uh, um, uh, factors that um, uh, is uh, very important, the, the development of, of tourism. You have a, a huge creative industry uh, that is very vibrant and well-known. You have all the, the natural attributes, uh, the different parks, uh, the wildlife. So obviously there is the potential there that can be tapped into. And we've seen countries that are now moving uh, uh, away uh, from the natural resources because they also have identified tourism as a, as a source of e economic development. And Nigeria uh, can be one of, of these countries that also uh, look to tourism and, and continue to develop in order to maximize the potential that this sector can bring to the country. Now, for you, how best can Nigeria take this advantage of its tourism sector to grow its economy? I think all the elements are there. It's a matter of, first of all, uh, getting all the, the, the stakeholders around the table, which the ministry uh, works uh, in, this, in this direction, uh, working with all the different line ministries, working with the private sector, in order to be able to, to map out. Because as I, as I mentioned earlier, we worked on a tourism master plan. Master plan, as you know, is there to give the guidance on the specific areas that the country can prioritize in order to... to to uh, continue the development of the tourism sector. Maybe now with the, with the arrival of COVID would be a good time also to relook at master plan because the priorities obviously have shifted as everywhere else so that then we can have clear guidance on the, on the priorities uh, following this pandemic of when Nigeria should put the focus in order to, to be able to further develop its uh, tourism sector. Now, are there countries in Africa Nigeria can actually emulate when it comes to tourism development, um, probably the strategies uh, perhaps those countries are putting in place to develop their strategy, uh, their tourism? We have Kenya, we have Egypt, uh, we have South Africa. Are there lessons for Nigeria to learn from these countries? Absolutely. There are always lessons to be learned. There's no one size fits all. Of course, when Nigeria would look at all, and we do this with our members, sometimes uh, um, they, we share the best practices, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, the countries have to look at their own specificities. There is something probably that Kenya is doing that doesn't necessarily adapt to Nigeria, but in all of this, Nigeria can learn from uh, what these countries are doing, as other countries can also learn. It's a, it's a two-way it's a two-way uh, thing that we can all learn from each other. But at the end of the day, we have to adapt it to our own specificity. And and Nigeria is no different than than any of the other countries. All right. Generally, what is the way forward for the world tourism industry? Well, what we are, what the key message uh, that is uh, out, uh, uh, especially and strongly supported by our Secretary General, is to continue to collaborate, to stand in solidarity, because we do have to restart the sector, but we also have to do it in a responsible way. We have to ensure that the right health protocols are in place. And these protocols, by the way, have to continuously be reviewed and updated because as we've seen, this pandemic, there's still a lot of unknown about this virus. It's still evolving. So we have to adapt because uh, on the one part, whilst we wait for a solution, health, uh, either be it with a vaccine or, or other, we have also to continue with the business because the damage that has been done globally and also to our recent is, is, is very dramatic. And as you know, if we don't restart tourism, we will still be stuck uh, where we are. So that's why we say restart, but in a responsible, safe manner, so that at least uh, we can uh, sort of uh, see some uh, rebound uh, with the tourism across the world. All right, thank you very much for your time, Elsia. Elsia Grandcourt is the director of Africa at the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chimpi. Thank you to take us through the burning economic issues and what they mean for the commodities market space is one of the research analysts with financial derivatives company, Desola Sumoni. Hi, Desola. 
Good morning. Well, it's a holiday. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a holiday here. Holiday weekend. And uh, of course, after a rough start to the week, we saw Brent crude recovering to about um, $43 uh, per barrel. That was yesterday on weaker US dollars and declining crude stockpiles, even though today there was a little drop. So but what was more interesting for you in the oil market this week? I'm like you rightly said, uh, Timothy started the week on a rough note. First, rising from rising on um, the weaker US dollar and expectations of a stimulus of another um, stimulus package in the US. But caps were gained again. The price gains were were capped by um, by uh, rising coronavirus cases. Then on Tuesday, we saw data from American Petroleum Institute show that show a bigger than expected or an unexpected um, increase in global in US uh, crude stockpiles, which is, is which uh, indicates uh, something about um, the level of oversupply in the market. So crude stockpiles increased by uh, about 6.8 million uh, barrels against expectations of um, a drawdown of a modest um, uh, sorry crude stockpiles declined. By about 6.8 million barrels against a modest against expectations of a modest drawdown of about uh, 350,000 barrels. On Wednesday, data from the U.S. government, the Energy Information Administration, further supported that view, showing a, a, a another another unexpected drawdown in uh, in crude stockpile about 10.6 million barrels. Again, against the expectations of of a, a modest drawdown of about 350,000 barrels. Now. If you look at the reports uh, more critically, you see that there was a buildup in gasoline, which is just petrol, uh, by about 700,000 barrels, which indicates that, you know, around this time of the year, there's a lot of, I mean, this is summer, and there's a lot of driving, summer driving going on. But because of this buildup, it indicates that, you know, people are not driving this year because of lockdown and because of working from home. And that has implications for the recovery of um, oil demand. And where do you see oil prices going into the holiday weekend? Uh, like Randy said, Chim, is the, um, the OPEC production cut ends tomorrow, 31st of July. That's the that production cut of about um, 9.6 million barrels per day. So from 1st of August, we're expecting that a new production cut comes into place, which is about 7.7 .7, uh, million barrels per day. So we're expecting an inflow and increase in supply of about um, 1.9 million barrels per day. Now, that's on the supply side. On the demand side, like you said, we are seeing again resurgence, increase in um, coronavirus cases. We are seeing people working, uh, working, uh, this, um, working from home because is uh, likely to persist for the long, for, for the near term, which you know, has implications for demand for oil, for transportation, as well as we are seeing low demand in uh, uh, so we're driving. We are seeing um, uh, commercial uh, is slowing, is flattening in the growth of commercial airflow. So all these factors together point to the fact that you know the recovery in oil demand will be slower. Now couple couple that with an increase in supply from OPEC coming from from Saturday, I think that prices are going to remain depressed in the next term, trading between somewhere between uh, forty and forty five dollars per barrel, and they may even go lower. Mm. All right, away from uh, the oil market, the World Bank in a recent study found that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement could boost Africa's income by as much as $450 billion. Can you summarize your key takeaways from the study and how do you think Nigeria can position herself to maximize the advantages of the trade pact? We've heard this. You must have heard about you know, the positives of the of the uh, African and Continental Free Trade Agreement. How you know is a is a single market of about 1.3 billion uh, people. How is it going to increase in traffic and trade by by uh, to about 50 percent? You know, you've heard of the good news, but the, my key takeaway from from the report was um, reducing reducing a uh, uh, trade cost. So the World Bank essentially so wrote like a policy brief essentially of how governments can maximize the potentials of the of the trade pact while minimizing the risk. And the key theme of it was reducing trade costs. The further went the, the, the further went to explain that you know the governments need to uh, um, simplify customs procedures and reduce red tape. We know how uh, red tape and bureaucracy you know limits business in Nigeria, in, in Nigeria as well as in other African countries. Another recommendation was for governments to make legislations and laws 
that would facilitate the easy and free movement of goods, of people, of, uh, of, of capital, and of information across borders. Those were the key take, those were my key takeaways. But in addition to that, in addition to you know the tariff, um, a tariff liberalization, the World Bank also encouraged you know reducing non-tariff barriers to trade, things like quotas, things, uh, factors like uh, quotas, uh, rules of origin. Also needs to be needs to be sorted out for the for for governments to you know maximize the uh, advantage of the trade path. Now for Nigeria, um, we know what we've heard the arguments on both sides, both the antagonists and protagonists argue for and against the trade path. But I think the key thing here is for its competitiveness. We all know that Nigerian manufacturing is not particularly competitive due to some binding infrastructure constraints. We know about the power situation, how you know. Uh, manufacturers have to sort their own power. So those kind of binding constraints need to be sorted out. And I know this is a long-term investment. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a year or two. But those are the kind of factors that we need to we need to put in place to become competitive. Also, the road networks. One key feature of African trade is road networks. And many of the road... Uh, 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 and if you look at the road networks of African country, you see the lack of interconnectedness. So I think one thing that Nigeria, as well as other African countries, need to do is to expand the road network and road and rail network, as well as the seaports, in order to maximize um, maximize the benefits of the of the free trade agreement. Uh, talking about power, there in, on your slide uh, among you, the downers is the fact that um, power crisis will worsen. How so? I think it has quite a piece. Yes, among the downers on your slide, you say that power crisis will worsen. Just wondering how so? Is it that the federal government is not doing enough to ensure that uh, we have steady power? No, I think that the, the, the government, they are making steps. Like I said on Tuesday, that the government is taking, the federal government is taking baby steps towards you know, improving the, the power situation. I mean, recently, was it yesterday or the day before, the, uh, the president approved um, mm. the, the counterfeit for, the counter funding for um, these projects with the these, with uh, Siemens, which is the German Electric and Engineering um, Agency, to rehabilitate and to expand Nigeria's grid. Currently, Nigeria the, we have installed capacity of about 12, mil, 12 um, megawatts and only produce about anywhere around 4,000 megawatts. So the, the goal is to you know rehabilitate and to expand expand the power grid. And the, the projection is that by 2020, by 2025, the, 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 we should be able to produce about, I think, 12,000 or, or, or no, 25,000 uh, megawatts. So I think the government is taking uh, baby steps, but it's not going to materialize uh, today or tomorrow, or even in, in this year. At least we're doing something. Anyway, let's look at yes. um, agri-commodities there. Cameroon's um, robust coffee prices have taken a beating due to lower demand. Where do you see coffee prices going forward? Even as small countries um, uh, lift lockdown restrictions, like you said, um, I mean, for context, for context, um, there are two main species of coffee, right? We have the arabica coffee and the robusta coffee. So the arabica coffee is uh, like the elitist coffee, but the robusta coffee is the one you and I drink. Is the is the um, instant coffee, the one you just put your hot water or milk and then you have your coffee. No now. <laughs> <laughs> before now, before now, coffee has already been in the beer market because of huge supply. And now with the with the coronavirus pandemic and lockdowns, we are seeing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cafes and restaurants which account for about twenty five percent of total global of total um, coffee consumption or coffee demand. They are not able to 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 that demand is out of the market. So I've seen coffee demand globally take a serious beating. In fact, the United States Department of Agriculture said for the first time since 2011, coffee demand is going to decline sharply because of people are working from home now. So that demand for, for coffee from cafes and restaurants is out of the market. And even as, 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 as countries begin to ease lockdown, People are still weary. I mean, many, many of these uh, supply, coffee supply chain, uh, uh, super, uh, coffee supply chain um, organizations, you know, they try to reinvent their business model, trying to order on
So I, I guess we'll have to leave this conversation here at the moment. Um, technology is not really friendly uh, today. Thank you for your time, Desola Sumoni. Uh, Desola Sumoni is one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. And for review of Wednesday's trading activities at the equities market, here is Edidion Ewan. Well, Edidion, just like your name, it's a ding-dong movement right even though it's a short trading week yes jimmy you're right the market seems to be moving in a zigzag pattern or just like you said in a ding dong movement yesterday the all share index gained 0 0.18 percent to twenty four thousand six hundred and ninety three point seven three points now that's after declining on tuesday the equity cap also rose to 12.881 trillion now now, although the market gained yesterday activity level was low compared to the previous sessions we've seen this week we saw just about 101.58 million units worth, barely a billionaire traded in over 3,600 deals. Sectoral performance was broadly positive yesterday as all the sectors we track closed positive apart from the banking index. Now, those declines were due to losses on Equibank Transnational Incorporated, GT Bank, and Zenith Bank. On the other hand, consumer goods, industrial goods, insurance, and oil and gas gained yesterday. Let's, let's bring in Phil Anegbe, a research analyst at Cardinal Stone Securities, for more. Good morning, Phil. Thank you for joining us on the program. Yeah, good morning, Eddie Dong. Let's talk about some earnings now. Sepla surged 10% yesterday after the company released its earnings, but there was a drop in revenue. So what drove the positive sentiment for the stock? Well, uh, a lot of it was bargain hunting uh, in the stock because prior to yesterday, you've seen uh, a lot of sell-offs in the stock. And that has largely tracked uh, the um, uh, moderation or the decline in their crude oil prices for extended periods. So uh, a number of uh, investors have sold the stock uh, to a level that it now became uh, attractive for bargain hunting. So what you saw yesterday was bargain hunting uh, in the stock. And of course, the impairment loss for Q2 was not as uh, huge as a number of uh, analysts had expected. Okay, still so talking about earnings now. MTN Nigeria also releases financials and revenue grew by over 12%, but profits before tax and profits after tax were lower. However, the telco is proposing an interim dividend of 3 naira 50 kobo per 2 kobo ordinary shares. That's likely to attract investors to the stock when trading resumes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you saw uh, MTN actually uh, grew their um, free cash flow uh, marginally which justifies their decision to pay a higher interim dividend uh, this time around relative to what they did in 2019. But uh, what was clear was that Q2 was a difficult quarter for the uh, company in terms of a high operating cost, even though revenue was up, but operating cost uh, pressures led to margins uh, decline. But we expect them to recover uh, in a good way in Q2, in Q3 and Q4. So uh, this ends uh, showing in terms of uh, resilience uh, on the cash flow front for MTN. So that justifies the dividend they paid, and it should also uh, excite uh, a number of investors next week. That's the expectation. Okay, so we've had a very short trading week this week, but what is your outlook for next week? Well, for next week, you expect investors to continue to react to earnings releases. Uh, we, see, we saw a, a couple of late earnings releases. Uh, yesterday, MTN was one of them. They expect investors to react to, the, to their decision to pay dividends, the higher dividends related to what they did last year. Uh, you also had a couple of business releases. Dangote Sugar re released their results. The result was better than expected. Uh, so investors are also likely to react to that. Then you also saw uh, the likes of uh, USCN. USCN reported an operating loss. So that may drive uh, sell-offs for the stock. 
Uh, so for next week, we expect mixed sentiments, mixed reactions to uh, the different earnings that are going to be released next week. And of course, uh, a bit of bargain hunting for uh, stocks that uh, um, investors consider are relatively cheap. Thank you for your input on the program, Phil. Phil Anebe is a research analyst at Cardinal Stone Securities. The NSD market, uh, the Onisa Securities market yesterday, there was a lot of profit taking during midweek session as the NSI did by 0.68% to 782 points. Now, this is after gaining in previous trading sessions. The market cap was also lower at 514.80 billion naira. We didn't see a lot of activity on the charts. We saw 405,530 unit worth 19.90 million naira, and all of that was traded in 19 deals. Well, we'll have to pause now. Over to you, Chimeze. Thank you very much, um, Eddie. And we'll be back um, with you again for the debt and currency market, but we'll take a break now. And then, of course, we'll cross over to London. And for updates from the streets of London, here is Juliana Olainka. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Well, Britain's biggest high street lender, Lyot's Banking Group, plunged to a second quarter loss after putting aside £2.4 billion for bad debts, forcing the bank to acknowledge that supporting customers through the COVID-19 crisis could come at a cost. A number of earnings have been released this week. Backless reported yesterday, Aston Martin, and so on. How would you describe uh, these results coming in so far? Well, the results are not great, uh, but I suppose credit impairment, which is putting aside uh, money for bad debt, has become a main feature for banks uh, uh, recently, particularly this year, of course, because they're all dealing with uh, COVID-19. We had Barclays reporting yesterday, HSBC reporting earlier in the week, and we've got NatWest, uh, formerly uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, on Friday. And next week, uh, we'll also uh, be hearing from uh, Santander. So it's not uh, been great. Lloyds have said uh, this morning, morning uh, that the COVID-19 lockdown has really affected them. And it's not just uh, these credit impairments, these bad debts. It's also these payment holidays. Uh, 1.1 billion pounds um, was given to customers or not taken from customers uh, during some mortgage holidays or some loaning holidays. And also, as you said, in the first half of the year, um, uh, Lloyd's have put aside 2.4 billion pounds. And they'll I presume that that's the main future, um, feature. That's the worry. Bank of England, uh, a couple of months ago, already told banks that they should be prepared uh, for these uh, bad debts that will arise from COVID-19. We also know at the moment um, interest rates here in the UK are at a historic low of 0.01%. So the profitability of banks at the moment are not great. And uh, shareholders this morning reacted badly. Uh, Lloyd's Banking Group shares were down 8%. And um, in the year to date, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group shares are down 50%. So that's a massive loss. And it looks like Boris Johnson is facing a major Brexit test with the future of Eurotunnel operations at stake. Now, the EU wants the UK to drop its opposition to a role for the European Court of Justice in British affairs to ensure trains keep running between France and the UK after Brexit is implemented on January 1. Can you tell us more about this? Well, this is a story that's being um, exclusively reported in The Guardian, which is a left-leaning uh, newspaper here in the UK. And again, uh, Brexit troubles are at the top of uh, the agenda for Boris Johnson, and it does involve the 30-mile Euro tunnel. Now, the European Court of Justice, I believe, is, is seen as a red flag uh, for negotiations between Brussels and Downing Street. Brexit supporters, particularly those on the hard right, want nothing to do with the ECJ. And uh, the European Court of Justice has found a huge issue with the Eurotunnel because, as you said, once the transition period comes to an end at uh, the end of this year, um, then there'll be no um, overarching jurisdiction deciding or settling disputes between France and Britain. And they've realised right now that that's going to be a problem because, of course, the two countries have two sets of rules. Um, somebody described it as trying to drive on the left and drive on the right at the same time. Train drivers would have to have quite qualifications that fit into UK law and fit into um, uh, French law. And so the European Commission are putting pressure on France to try and um, ask and urge the British government to allow the European Court of Justice to have jurisdiction on that 
it is a red flag. Um, Downing Street are, you know, putting their foot down and saying they don't want the ECJ to have any involvement because once they have involvement in one aspect or one sector, uh, then it can start creeping into others. And now I believe that uh, some are suggesting that the International Arbitration Court in The Hague uh, could potentially be used um, as a mediator to settle disputes between the two sides. But this is ongoing. There are so many other um, negotiation um, um, aspects that need to be resolved uh, between the two uh, countries. But of course, the Euro Tunnel was staple uh, between French and British ties, and they want that to be resolved amicably uh, before the autumn. But uh, uh, some people would say uh, that's unlikely to happen. Hmm. And in another news, Boeing has announced it will end production of its um, 747 airliner in 2022, signaling the end of the Super Jumbo era. Uh, is this a, any concern for UK airlines? Well, it is a concern uh, for UK airlines, Jimmy, but I would say it's a concern for, for airlines across the world. We've seen over the past couple of months, tens of thousands of jobs have been going. We already <coughs> saw British Airways have dropped uh, one of their um, airlines earlier this month. Qantas Airline have also decided to drop some of their fleets because they just don't have the numbers. A lot of these uh, big old fashioned jumbo jets were already uh, going to be discontinued way down the line, but they've decided uh, to bring it forward forward uh, just because there is no money. Um, I believe that Boeing, when they reported um, their sales, their sales were down $2.4 billion in <clears throat> the second quarter of this year. And I'm sure many of our viewers will remember that Boeing are already involved in a, a, a huge scandal before COVID took over. And that's with their 737 MAX jet, which of course killed 346 people in two different crashes. And so Boeing already said earlier this year that they were going to get rid of 10,000, um, 16,000 jobs. Um, and that's 10% of um, their workforce. It is likely going to increase again the airline industry is completely battered at the moment and the funds are just not coming in uh, some industry experts don't um, expect passenger numbers to reach a uh, pre-covid capacity for another three or four years so a lot of these airlines that were going to be discontinued or these air um, uh, planes that were going to be discontinued um, a few years down the line have been brought forward to reduce costs all right, thank you very much, uh, Juliana. I'm sure more earnings will be out and we hope to get updates from you later in the day. Thank you. And back here, we'll look at the debt and currency market. Eddie. Jimmy, the bond market reversed its bullish trend and ended midweek session negative as average yields across the curve rose by seven basis points. Now, there was actually a lot of demand on that counter as we've seen a lot of unfavorable rates on other counters. So investors really ran over to the bond market. We had 60 deals worth 50.01 billion naira. Finally, we had some activity at the Nigerian Treasury bills market. Although it was very minimal, average yields on that segment remained unchanged. Uh, the primary market auction yesterday, the CBN offered Nigerian Treasury bills worth 265.95 billion naira across the 91-day, the 182-day, and 364-day tenors. There were just two deals on that counter worth 180.0 million naira. <clears throat> There was also some demand at the automobiles market yesterday as we saw yields increase on the 30th of March 2021 and the 5th of January 2021 tenors. On that counter, we had 33 deals worth 134.76 billion naira. Although the markets are closed today and tomorrow for the Eid holidays, let's talk to Caleb Alimi, a fixed income dealer at FSDH Market Merchant Bank for a wrap up of the markets. Good morning, Caleb. Thank you for joining us on the program. Hi, thank you for having me. Good morning. It's been a short work week with just three trading days because of the holiday, but how would you say the fixed income markets performed this week? Um, so for fixed income, let's start with the bond market. The bond market saw a bit more activity. We've continued to see demand or, uh, for, for investment on that, in that side. So we'll be seeing you know, demand has persisted there. Also the treasury bills market, like you mentioned, a bit of activity is coming into that space, especially for the Mobiles, and that's not far fetched. That's because the, um, there's a lot of interbank liquidity in the system, so the banks have to plug in this excess cash. Also, you mentioned the NCB auction yesterday, where we saw 
you know, improved volumes. Uh, I mean, people continue to demand these securities, and we saw that for the 91 day and the one to the treasury bills at the auction, the yields dropped, you know, slightly. Um, and then at the long end, you saw a slight uptick for the one year treasury bill. You saw a slight uptick of about five basis points, and that is because of the increased volume. But what we expect to continue to see in the fixed income market, despite the short week and even into next week as we resume, is for investors to continue to plug in their excess cash and the excess liquidity. We expect to see demand continue both at the uh, bond space and in the treasury bill space as well. Thank you, Caleb, for your input on the program. Caleb Alimi is a fixed income dealer at FSDH Merchants Bank. That is on the market review. Over to you, Jimmy. Thanks, Eddie. And that's it on the program for today. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimize Obi Iwago.